All right, so last week we looked at verses 1 through 2 in this chapter, in Exodus chapter 12. And we looked at the first month of the year. And this week we're going to begin looking at some of the particulars in regards to the Passover animal and also in regards to the timing of the sacrifice of the Passover. So we want to begin in verses 3 through 5. I think I'll read that to start with. Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their father's households, one animal per household. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each person will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. So the animal was to be selected on the 10th day of the month of Abib, and each household was to select an animal, it says. The father's household here refers to the patriarch in each household, which would be the oldest living father in the house who served Yahweh. That would be the patriarch, the male head of the household. Not just immediate, but his descendants. The animal was to be an animal of the flock. Some translations say lamb here, but the Hebrew word is say, S-E-H, and it is broader than just sheep. The Hebrew word refers to smaller flock animals, and that word say can be used for a sheep or a goat, and it can also be used for a male or a female. This is why a few verses later, the instruction in verse 5 is to take the animal from either the sheep or the goats. And it says the animal must be male because the word animal of the flock or the Hebrew word say is generic. So it specifies male and you can take it either from the sheep or of the goats. In my studies, it appears through history that a sheep was preferred, but it was okay if you didn't have a sheep, you could use a goat. Verse 5 also specifies the age of the animal to be a year old male. I'll talk about more of that here in just a bit. Verse 4 tells us that the combined families could eat the same Passover lamb in one house. So some households would be too small for the whole animal. And what that would mean is there would be a lot of wasted meat if you had too big of an animal or too small of a household, I should say. So you combine neighbors who followed Yahweh and you share the meal under one roof. What this lets us know is that the sheep or the goat that was to be sacrificed was a good-sized animal. It's been a while now, but I tried to think about it this week, and I think it's been probably 10 to 12 years ago that we made the switch in the age of the lamb that we would slaughter for the Passover. Uh, We formerly used a male in the first year of its life. And we got that from the King James Version's rendering of verse 5, which says your lamb will be without blemish, a male of the first year. The phrase of the first year in the King James, we thought, referred to a sheep or a goat from birth up until one year old. The problem with this, and this is why we switched, but the problem with this is, one, that doesn't make sense of the instructions that are found in verse 4. How could a household be too small for an animal that was only a month or two or three months old? There's not much meat at all on the three-month-old lamb. So it doesn't make sense for Moses or for Yahweh through Moses to say, if the household is too small for the animal, then invite your neighbors that serve Yahweh to keep it under your roof. Those instructions would make sense if the animal was larger and a lot of meat would be available for the Passover meal. Secondarily, the King James Version and a few other translations say something like animal of the flock, a male of the first year, but most translations say a year old male. The Hebrew here reads ben ha shane. What that literally means is son of a year. Young's literal translation translates it as son of a year, and the literal New American Standard Bible says male a year old. 
The Septuagint text, which is the oldest known complete Old Testament in existence today, dates back to around 250 B.C. It's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Septuagint reads, male of a year old or a one-year-old male. I have three or four different translations of the Septuagint at home. And so there's a couple renderings there. An interesting side note here is from the Jewish historian Philo. In his writing titled, Questions and Answers on Exodus, Philo talks about the age of the Passover animal. The question is given as, Why does Moses command them to take a perfect male sheep of one year? And in Philo's answer, and I'll just read part of it, the pertinent part, he writes this, The sheep is to be a year old since the males become perfect in a year. For having added perfect as a sort of prime consideration, he further adds those details in which it is perfect, namely that it is more perfect than the female, while the year old shows the time sufficient for the perfecting of such animals. That is the literal meaning. So my point here in citing Philo is that he speaks of the age of the Passover animal as though it is widely understood. Philo doesn't give a lengthy dissertation on how old the animal is to be because he understands the scriptures to be clear, and so did all the other ancient Israelites. Else this would be quite controversial. But Philo speaks in a way, and he writes in a way, that shows that everyone understood that the animal had to be a year old, and he's just giving his understanding on why he thinks that Yahweh specified a year old male. Verse 5 also says that the animal of the flock is to be without blemish. This refers to the quality of the animal. All sacrifices that were given to Yahweh were to be from healthy, whole, clean animals. The animal could not be sick. The animal could not have one of its members missing. The animal was to be robust and healthy and worth something. You are never to bring a gift to Yahweh that does not mean something to you. It's easy to let go of something that you don't want or that you don't value or that you don't prize. It is much more difficult to let go of something that you have money tied up into and that you value and that is worth a lot to you. In 2 Samuel 24, there is an account of King David purchasing a threshing floor and some oxen for sacrifice to Yahweh. And there's a man named Arana. Arana the Jebusite, he's called. Arana was just going to give King David his threshing floor, oxen, and some ox yokes for firewood. Arana said, you can have it, O king. David wanted to offer a sacrifice because Yahweh was mad at David. David had done something wrong and Yahweh sent a destroying angel that wiped out 70,000 men in Israel. And David was going to make amends with Yahweh. And he went to Arana's place and asked to purchase the oxen, the threshing floor, and the ox yokes. Arana said, you can have it, you're the king. He bowed down before him. But David needed the animals to sacrifice to Yahweh. And he needed the animals to obey a commandment that a prophet named Gad, Gad the seer, had given to David. Yahweh spoke to David through this prophet named Gad. And in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, you can also find this in 1 Chronicles 21, David says this to Arana. The king answered Arana, No, I insist on buying it from you for a price. For I will not offer to Yahweh my Elohim burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 20 ounces of silver. And there's some variant there in how much he paid for it. Not just in 2 Samuel 24, but in the parallel text of 1 Chronicles chapter 21. It's for another sermon and another time. The point here is this. A sacrifice is to be a sacrifice. If your service to Yahweh is not costing you something or it is not the best that you have to offer, is it really a sacrifice? I thought about this today when I was putting the last touches on my sermon. If you never run into a situation in your service to Yahweh where Yahweh upsets your boat 
or upsets your apple cart or something rubs you the wrong way, then you're probably not studying to the fullest extent that you need to be studying. Anytime we devote our whole life to Yahweh, we're going to run into situations and commandments and things and areas in our life that's going to have to make a lot of change. And if that's never happened to you in your walk, then maybe you need to study more and devote more to the Creator. Next we come to Exodus chapter 12 verse 6, which says you are to keep it, speaking of the Passover animal, until the 14th day of this month. We talked last week about the month means the 14th day of the lunar month or the moon. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. Okay, that's Holman Christian Standard Bible. First off, the animal is to be slaughtered on the 14th day of the moon, which that begins or kicks off the Passover. The plague that came over the land of Egypt would happen that night. I believe the plague took place on the 15th day of the moon. But Passover began, the ordinances and the slaughtering of the lamb began on the 14th day of the moon. The sacrifice is what begins the feast. Secondly, it is to be done by the whole assembly of the community. This does not mean that every single individual in the community held the knife for the slaughter, the kosher slaughter, but that all the community were there participating in what was happening. They were there experiencing the Passover. Now, I have a picture here from 2012. This is our Passover from 2012. And this commandment about the whole community and the whole assembly, this is why that I have always involved my family at the Passover slaughter. Since my children were little, I've had them there with me for not just the meal, but for the slaughter. My little Rosalind's there on her knees. Elijah's there in the background. Benjamin's got the blue hat on behind me. We see Brother TJ right there across from me. And then I even seen Jake today. Jacob's here with us. He's up there on the right. And this is what is meant by the whole assembly and the whole community participating. I've always wanted to instill in my children a love for what Yahweh has commanded. Now just last year I received an email from someone who was listening to some of my teachings. Most of the emails that I receive are good positive emails. Every now and then, though, I receive very hateful emails. Um, I'd be lying if I said that it didn't bother me a little bit. It's gotten a little bit less of a bother, but it just worries me when people lash out towards someone that they really have never met or known. And we need to keep that in mind when we're talking with somebody through email or social media. You need to always remember that a person is on the other side of that screen. They have feelings. And that you should speak to them in a way that you would talk to them as if you were face to face, could see their facial expressions and their, hear their emotion. But I got an email um, from someone that had been listening to some of my teachings and then somebody else told them that I slaughtered a lamb for Passover. And they emailed me to find out if that was true and I just responded very simple, very short, just a couple of sentences, told them I obeyed the commandments in Exodus chapter 12. And I got a very ugly response. It was so ugly that I deleted it from off of my computer. Um, and the response had a lot to do with animal cruelty I was being accused of. And this person even asked if it was legal to do such. And I let out a big sigh. <sighs> breathed in and out for a little bit because I realized that a lot of people are just not able to understand the ways of Yahweh. Now, we are to treat animals with respect. The book of Proverbs says, or it might be Psalms, that a righteous man or woman uh, takes care or regards the life of his or her animal. We should never provoke animals to wrath or hunt them for sport. We should not do anything that disrespects an animal or brings harm to an animal. But that doesn't mean that we're not allowed to slaughter and eat the animals that Yahweh told us were clean or fit for consumption. Yahweh created certain animals to be received as food with thanksgiving. I had my little grandson at my house the other day, and I always take him out to see the animals when he's at the house. We went over to the neighbors, and we saw the horse. And we went to my house, and we saw the chickens. Then we saw the dogs. And I've, I've got a sheep now at my house getting ready for the Passover. We saw the sheep. And I told little Bowen, he can't speak now, but you'd be surprised how much little children can understand. So I told him, I said, these are all Yahweh's creatures. 
and we are to respect all of them. And he's just sitting there looking at me. I held him in my arms. And I said, but the horse is unclean. We don't eat the horse. That's the reason we don't eat the horse. The chickens, they're clean. The sheep, it's clean. The dogs, no, we don't eat the dogs. They're unclean. Why do we not slaughter a dog and eat it, but we do slaughter a sheep and eat it? There's one reason. The reason is because Yahweh deems the dog to be unfit for consumption. And Yahweh deems the sheep to be fit for consumption. Like the old TV show says, Father knows best. He does. He always gives us commands for our good. So we're to treat animals with respect, but that does not mean we cannot slaughter animals that Yahweh deems fit for consumption. Many people forget that any meat that we eat has to be slaughtered by somebody. Those burgers from Five Guys don't just appear out of thin air. The meat or the animal had to be slaughtered to get the beef. In some cases, the meat people eat may even come from animals who have not been treated properly or humanely, which I do not agree with. Even a clean animal that is being raised for a slaughter has the right to live a good life until the time comes for the slaughter. I told my wife yesterday, I said, I want my sheep, I have gave him a name. His name is Horatio. <laughs> I, tell him, I want Horatio to live a good life until the Passover comes. And then he's going to have to give his life for our consumption for the Passover. It's going to be difficult, a little more difficult for me this year. I don't think it should ever be something that's not difficult at all um, because we should not only thank Yahweh, but we should thank the animal when the animal has to give its life for us to consume meat. But it's going to be a little bit more difficult for me because I have purchased a Passover sheep that is very tame. <laughs> and I've even named him, like I said. He's so tame that he's a little obnoxious <laughs> because every time I go into the pen... He takes his head and he rubs all over my thigh right there on the blue jeans or the pants. And, I mean, he'll come right up to you, stick your hand in the fence, he'll come right up to you and he likes to be scratched right there <laughs> between his eyes and his nose. And he gets right up on me. And he's just extremely tame. He loves to eat. Every time I start talking sheep language, he looks for me. And I look for him every day when I go to the back of the property. So it's going to be difficult for me to slaughter him. But you know what? I think that's how it should be. We are so far removed from growing our own food and raising our own animals that we have forgotten where our food comes from. I watched a video on YouTube one time where the classroom of little children younger than David, probably five or six years old, they asked them where the food came from and they said it comes from the truck or it comes from the store. And they don't understand that a lot of food grows out of the ground <laughs> or grows on the trees. Or is raised, is birthed and then raised for slaughter. We are not appreciative of an animal's life because we just eat meat without remembering that something, some creature, had to give up its life for us to have meat. Raising animals for slaughter helps bring things back into proper perspective. I think a hundred years ago, I would not have got that email, not just because technology didn't exist, <laughs> but because... All the old-timers slaughter their own animals, for the most part, on farms. I also want to talk a little bit here about animal sacrifices because the Passover animal is a sacrifice. It is not a sin sacrifice. It is not a burnt offering that is totally consumed, but it is a fellowship offering or a peace offering. Fellowship or peace offering in Hebrew is shelamim, and it means that the worshiper that brings the sacrifice and his family that serve Yahweh, they gather together, to eat of the fellowship sacrifice. Some fellowship sacrifices could be eaten on the first two days after they were sacrificed. This one in particular, the Passover, can only be eaten the night after it is sacrificed. Animal sacrifices scare Christian people so much, but it doesn't scare this Christian. <laughs> um, I'm a follower of the Christ, a follower of the Messiah. And as we'll see here in a little bit, even our Messiah upheld the law of Moses when it pertained to animal sacrifices. Throughout Scripture, we find that when men properly offered an animal sacrifice to Yahweh, whether for thanksgiving, appreciation, fellowship meal, or a sin or guilt offering, Yahweh always considered it a sweet-smelling savor. Read the first three chapters of Leviticus, and after every instruction on the sacrifice, it'll say it will be a sweet-smelling savor to Yahweh. That could be literal, that Yahweh actually smells the aroma. 
Could be metaphorical, could be both. Could mean that Yahweh accepts the offering. Even early on, Yahweh accepted Abel's offering of the firstling of the flock and the fat portions thereof in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4. Yahweh accepted Noah. That's the picture I have on the screen. Noah's offering of the clean animals when the flood had stopped and rescinded and Noah got off the boat. Genesis 8, 20-22. And the Bible says that when Noah offered up of the clean animals that Yahweh smelled the sweet aroma of Noah's burnt offering, he was pleased and he promised never again to flood the earth. Even Yeshua in Matthew 8, 1-4, after he healed a leper of his serious skin disease... He told the man, don't spread this around, what I've done. The miracle that i performed, don't spread it around, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded in the law. This is what Yeshua said. Yeshua always upheld the law of prophet Moses, which was ultimately the law of Yahweh. Now, I have a whole series of teachings on animal sacrifices, about six or seven parts, I think. And I also have a teaching, a video teaching on YouTube that I taught last year in regards to the Passover sacrifice. So I would recommend anyone who has interest or issue with this subject to take the time to listen to the study material that I present in those lessons. Uh, We must forget the traditions of man and we must return to the old paths. And by old paths, I don't mean 1950s Baptist doctrine or early 1900s Pentecostal Azusa Street doctrine as the old path scripture is presented. I mean the ways of men like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Shem and Melchizedek. Those are the old paths that we must return to. Who did the actual Passover slaughter? I believe the scripture teaches that it was the heads of the households, which would be the male patriarchs or elders. I think we get that understanding from verse 3 where it speaks of the father's households. There is a reference to this in 2 Chronicles 30, 15-17 where the Levites had to take charge of the Passover slaughter due to many men in the nation of Israel that were not consecrated or purified properly. The implication is, had the men been properly consecrated, they would have been allowed to perform the sacrifice and the Levites would not have had to take over. Philo, that old Hebrew historian that lived before, during, and after the time of the Messiah, helps us out again here. He writes this about the Passover in his writing called the Decalogue 30, 159. He says this, speaking of Passover, on which the whole nation sacrifices, each individual among them, not waiting for the priests, since on this occasion the law has given for one especial day in every year a priesthood to the whole nation, so that each private individual slays his own victim on this day. I also found three other places in the works of Philo today where he basically says the same thing, and they actually go into a little bit more detail. Special Laws 2, Life of Moses 2, and Q&A on Exodus 10. What time on the 14th day of Abib was the Passover slaughtered? Well, this translation of Exodus 12, verse 6, the Bible that I normally use, HCSB, says twilight. I don't think that that's the best translation. The term twilight refers to the soft, diffused light from the sky when the sun is below the horizon, either from dawn to sunrise or from sunset to nightfall. It's sometimes used metaphorically in speech to refer to a person's later or older years of their life or their arena. For instance, somebody might write that an actor was in the twilight of his career. At BibleHub.com, you can compare 27 English translations of the Bible. And at Exodus 12, verse 6, 10 of these translations say the Passover was to be sacrificed at twilight. Eleven translations say, sacrifice it at evening or even. The remaining six translations read as follows. New English translation says, around sundown. The, uh, I believe that's the good word translation, GWT, reads at dusk. Uh, JPS Tanakh reads at dusk. Brenton's translation of the Septuagint reads, I think this is significant, it reads toward evening. That's the Septuagint. 
Darby's translation reads between the two evenings and Young's literal translation reads between the evenings. Now, Darby's translation and Young's literal are the most literal rendering of the Hebrew here. The Hebrew text here reads, Bain ha arbayim. And that literally means between the evenings. I think that the Septuagint helps us greatly here by saying toward evening. In other words, you have not arrived at evening, sundown, but you are somehow moving toward evening, i.e. in the afternoon. Let's compare this with a couple of other texts. Leviticus 23 verse 5 says this, reading from the KJV. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is Yahweh's Passover. However, the Hebrew here at, for at even is again, Bain Ha Arbayim, or between the evenings. Thus, Darby's translation and Young's literal read here, between the evenings. The Septuagint reads, between the evening times. I have a few other translations of the Septuagint in my library. The New English translation of the Septuagint reads, in the middle of the time approaching evening. And the Lexham English Septuagint, this is a fairly new translation that just came out last year. I have this and it says, in the middle of the evenings. So the Septuagint again lends to the time being before evening, yet approaching or towards evening. Let's move from Leviticus 23.5, which is a sister text to Exodus 12, to another text that's comparable. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 6, we have another text instructing us about the Passover time. I'm just going to read the pertinent part of the verse. Deuteronomy 16, verse 6, in part says, Thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even at the going down of the sun. That's King James Version. Now, some people who believe that the lamb was sacrificed at dusk, point to this verse as their proof. The problem is that the view that the Passover was sacrificed at dusk does not take into account the Septuagint text at Exodus 12.5 toward evening and Leviticus 23.5 between the evening times, both of which show that the Passover was sacrificed before evening ever arrived. Yet, how do we harmonize those texts... Leviticus 23, Exodus 12, with this one in Deuteronomy 16 that says the sacrifice is at even at the going down of the sun. First off, let me point out that the Septuagint translations that I have read basically the same. At even, at the setting of the sun, in the evening to the setting of the sun, and in the evening at sunset. So if all we had to go on was Deuteronomy 16, verse 6, even in the Septuagint, we could, we could arrive at the conclusion that the Passover was to be sacrificed at dusk. The problem is, though, that we must harmonize all of the available evidence in Holy Scripture. I believe that the harmony is to recognize that the sun has two settings or two evenings. This is why we have the phrase in Hebrew, Bain Ha Arbayim, or between the evenings. The sun begins to set after high noon, And then it sets again at dusk. The sun begins to go down at one point and then goes down again as it drops below the hemisphere of the earth. Once the sun begins going down after it's directly overhead, that's the first evening. The second evening is when the sun drops below the earth. In between is the period we call the afternoon or between the two evenings. Now, don't confuse midday with 12 noon. Some people think that midday is 12 noon, and that's what it is maybe on our watch or on our clock. But 12 noon is derived from what I'm talking about, but it's not correct. 12 noon does not equal solar high noon. Solar high noon is determined by the sun's daily path in the sky. The hours of the day were determined by the Hebrews, not by looking at a clock on their wall or their wristwatch or their smartwatch made by Apple, right? They didn't look at that, but they watched the sun's movement in the sky as it went through the sky on any given day. Each day had 12 hours, but these hours in ancient Bible times were not 60-minute increments as we know them today. These hours varied in length depending upon what season of the year that you were in. 
At spring and fall, the hours would be more equal in length. But during the winter months, the hours would be shorter. Why? Because the days were shorter. During the summer months, the hours would be longer. Why? Because the days were longer. Twelve increments in the day, twelve hours of the day. This is how somebody like the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 when there were people that were accusing the apostles of being drunk on new wine. And Peter said, these men are not drunk as you suppose because it's but the third hour of the day. Peter was saying it's early in the morning. We don't drink this early. So they, they couldn't be drunk. It was because he recognized the path of the sun in the sky. And I believe that the ancient Hebrews could look at the sun and tell time just as quick as I can look at a wristwatch with a long and a short hand and tell you what time that it is on any given day. Now, this coming Passover, the sun will peak above the horizon at a, around 7.13 a.m. and the sun will drop below the horizon at about 8.01 p.m. High noon, solar high noon, not 12 noon, solar high noon will be at 1.37 p.m., post-meridian as we term it. Even though what people now call noon is always 12 o'clock. But we don't want today's noon. We don't want today's midday. We want to find midday by looking to the path of the sun because after midday, the sun will begin to go down. It will begin to set. And this will be the first evening or the first sundown. This helps us harmonize the texts that say that Passover is to be sacrificed toward evening. Septuagint, Exodus 12.5. Or in the middle of the time approaching evening. Septuagint, Leviticus 23, verse 5. And then we have Deuteronomy 16, verse 6, which says, in the evening at sunset. Deuteronomy 16, verse 6 is speaking of the first evening. Exodus and Leviticus are speaking of the second evening. Once we understand that there are two evenings or two going downs of the sun, one at midday and another one at dusk, the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Now, we have further evidence of this, what I just explained, in both the writings of Philo and Josephus. Uh, Philo and Josephus do not just give their opinion or their interpretation of when the Passover was to be sacrificed. They describe what all the Hebrews did in their lifetime. Millions of Hebrews. This is significant because Philo and Josephus both lived during the second temple period. And that would have been the same time that Yeshua the Messiah lived. So when Yeshua went to Jerusalem with his parents for the Passover, Luke chapter 2 says they did it every year. The Passover animals were sacrificed at the time of day that Philo and Josephus record for us. They are recording what was taking place during the Second Temple period. In Special Laws 2, 27, 145, Philo speaks of the Passover and says, "...on which the whole people offer sacrifice beginning at noonday and continuing till evening." Remember, noonday would be at the first going down of the sun, and evening would be at the second going down of the sun here. Josephus adds this in the Jewish Wars, book 6, chapter 9, part 423. So these high priests, upon the coming of that feast which is called Passover, when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour until the eleventh, but so that a company not less than ten belong to every sacrifice, then he goes on further information. But Josephus gives a more narrow time frame. Philo says from noon, beginning at noon until evening. Josephus says between the ninth and the eleventh hours. And that ninth and eleventh hour this time of the year for us would probably equal five to seven, maybe four to six, maybe even three to five, um, which is between the two evenings. Uh, one last point as I close today. If the Passover was sacrificed in the afternoon of the 14th between the two evenings, then it had to be eaten the upcoming night, which I believe to be reckoned biblically as the beginning of the 15th, the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th, because I believe all Sabbaths um, are from evening to evening based upon the Torah. So the ordinance of slaughtering, skinning, and cooking was done on the 14th, between the two evenings, but the eating of it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs was done on the 15th, and that kicked off the feast of unleavened bread because the lamb was to be eaten with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. This is why we still do that today. 
The 15th day of Abib is the day in which the Israelites were delivered from or brought out of the land of Egypt by that final plague. That final plague is what jump-started their deliverance. And I'll talk more about that in my upcoming sermons. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Thank you for your word. It truly is a light to our path. Thank you for the Passover. I love your ways. Help us all to love them even more than we ever have. Praise you, Yahweh. Hallelujah. Amen.